For over 140 days, they've stood out, but now they can no longer. This week, the British and Indian Army at Kut surrenders to the Ottoman Empire. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to the Great War. Last week saw naval action off the English coast, though the European fronts were mostly quiet because of rains and floods. But in the Middle East, the British position had become desperate, as neither British nor Russian relief could make it through. And since it's the big news this week, let's go there first. On April 29, 1916, General Charles Townsend surrendered at Kut al Amara to the Ottoman Empire. Historian James Morris called this the most abject capitulation in Britain's military history. And when you think about it, more men surrendered here at Kut than did to the Americans at Yorktown. So this was a huge victory for the Turks. And since it came only a few months after the British debacle at Gallipoli, the British public was shocked. The men had been under siege since early December and starvation and disease were now epidemic. And photos from this month are horrifying. 2,500 sick and wounded men were allowed their freedom in exchange for a similar number of Ottoman troops in British captivity. But over 3,000 British and 6,000 Indians were taken prisoners. The next day, the newly captured troops began their long march towards Anatolia and prison camp. So the Mesopotamian front grew quiet for the time being. But another front flared to life this week, the Italian front. Now, the Italian forces that were massing along the Isonzo River were larger and better armed than they had been in 1915. And Italian Army Chief of Staff Luigi Cadorna gave responsibility for a future offensive against Gorizia to the Third Army and beefed it up by transferring General Luigi Capello and his Sixth Corps in from the Second Army. Capello was given a major role in the planned offensive. He was to take Mount Sabatino, Oslavia, and Podgora to open up the way across the Isonzo and take Gorizia. Capello had promoted Pietro Badoglio to colonel. Badoglio would later be commander of the Italian army in World War II. And now, in 1916, he showed his worth by analyzing the problems likely to face the Sixth Corps. His planning began with both infantry and air patrols to reconnoiter Austro-Hungarian defensive positions. And he really studied each element of the earlier battles along the Isonzo to try to anticipate Austrian commander Svetozar Borojevich von Bonja's overall response to Italian actions. He reorganized his artillery, so each group had specific targets, something really missing in the last battle in March, and he improved communication between artillery and infantry, and he created a mobile response force of 18 cavalry and four bicycle squadrons. Those squadrons and fresh regiments would follow the fighting infantry units into battle, since in earlier battles, once troops reached their first objectives, they were often too exhausted to exploit success or resist counterattacks. So this would hopefully tackle that problem. On May the 4th, the Italian army made a diversionary attack on the southern Corso. This was supposed to fool Borojevich into believing it would be the main force of the future offensive, so that he would hopefully transfer troops south from Gorizia. The attack began with a four-hour artillery barrage, and then four divisions quickly captured the first line of Austro-Hungarian trenches. Borojevich argued with Austrian high command for immediate reinforcement, but Austrian Army Chief of Staff Konrad von Hotzendorf wouldn't oblige. So unfortunately for Cadorna, no Austrian troops were transferred from north to south. And further to the northwest was an attack that was anything but diversionary. At Verdun, where the endless battle was over two months old, on May 3rd, 500 German heavy guns opened fire on a front about a mile wide. The bombardment continued for two days and nights. Alistair Horn writes that the men on the ground thought that, as if to finish us off, the Germans had decided to point one cannon at each one of us. This was the big German attempt on Cote 304, a major strategic target and General von Galwitz had vowed to blast the French off the hillside. It seemed that he was succeeding, because there were no deep shelters left after all the weeks of bombardment. Horn writes, One French officer describes how he was buried three times that day in his trench and dug out each time by his men. Other men were less fortunate. Of one battalion, only three men were said to have survived. Many of the remainder were simply buried alive by the shells. 
One by one, the French machine guns were destroyed. For over two days, no food or supplies could be got through to the defenders, nor any wounded evacuated. Reinforcements fortunate enough to arrive got lost in the chaos atop the ridge. It was impossible to move. Orders had pushed up men on top of men and set up a living wall against the monstrous German avalanche. The Germans finally got a foothold on the summit, but it was three more days of close combat before Coat 304 was finally theirs. The German conquerors immediately demanded double rations of cigars to mask the smell of the corpses. Indeed, the Germans had the smell of the dead in their bread and water. The earth surrounding them was so packed with dead bodies that it permeated everything. But the capture of Cote 304 was the first break in the French line of resistance, and the stage was set for a big attack on the Morton. It would come soon. And something else happened on May the 1st in eastern France. James Girard, American ambassador to Germany, protested directly to the Kaiser himself at Charleville, German army headquarters, about the continuing policy of German subs sinking merchant ships. The Kaiser took the opportunity to rail against the British blockade and American compliance with it. Girard pressed the Kaiser to have the subs exercise the right of visit and search, but must not torpedo or sink any vessels unless the passengers and crew are put in a place of safety. On the 4th came the official reply. Germany will no longer sink vessels without warning and without saving life, unless there is resistance or an attempt to escape. This was the Sussex Pledge, named after the passenger ship torpedoed by the Germans in March. While Gerard was happy to receive the pledge, he wrote to the US State Department that he believed Germany would at some future date forced by public opinion and by von Tirpitz and the conservative parties, take up ruthless submarine war again, possibly in the autumn, but at any rate, about February or March 1917. Thing is, there was a split between the German military, which was all for lack of restrictions, and Chancellor von Bethmann Holweg, who represented the civilian government. He made pledges and the Navy disregarded them, and the Kaiser was either unwilling or unable to really support the Chancellor, but with Admiral von Tirpitz's sudden retirement, things seemed to swing towards the Chancellor. One thing you have to realize, under German censorship, the U-boat campaign was reported in only boastful terms, with little or nothing about non-combatant and civilian deaths, so the German people were uniform in demanding its continuation. Something else the German people probably didn't hear too much about was this. April 30th saw the third German gas attack against the British in four days on the Western Front. This was a front over three kilometers wide, but wind blew the gas this day over 10 kilometers behind the British lines. Rats, cows, and pigs all fell in droves. 89 soldiers died and over 500 were incapacitated. And we reached the end of another week of war, the 93rd. With poison gas in the west, the Italians launching a diversion, the Germans taking a vital tactical position at Verdun, and a British humiliation in Mesopotamia. And it was a big one, but a well-deserved one. I mean, what did they expect? They had marched upriver, undermanned, under-equipped, with no supply chain against forces with modern weapons like machine guns that could easily be supplied from their base at Baghdad. What did they expect? Historian Jeffrey Eaton wrote of the men being marched away, none of them fit to march five miles, full of dysentery, beriberi, scurvy, malaria, and enteritis. They had no doctors, no medical stores, and no transport. They would also be treated with extreme brutality by their captors, and two-thirds of the British and nearly a third of the Indians would never see their homes again. What did they expect? This was modern war. The Siege of Kut was the longest siege of the entire war. Another long siege happened on the Eastern Front, though, in the fortress of Przemysl. And if you want to find out more about that, you can click right here to see our episode about it. Our Patreon supporter of the week is That Austrian. And no, that is not Konrad von Hotzendorf's ghost. At least I hope so. I really hope so. Anyway, uh, support us on Patreon to make this show even better and better. And hopefully you can meet us one day on original World War I locations sometime in the future. Don't forget to subscribe. See you next time.